To protect Antarctica and the Southern Ocean is to protect our own future on this planet. The impacts of global warming on polar ice affect everyone. One of the things about being a climate scientist these days is this mix of discovery. You know, you, you go someplace new and you find out something new and then this, two seconds later, this realization of, that's not good. And there's one Australian city that has more to do with polar science than most. So Hobart's quite a small city, but we've actually got a huge concentration of the world's Antarctic and Southern Ocean scientists, but also some of the most important climate scientists and most significant contributors to the IPCC process. Through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, science informs decision-making by the world, for the world. So that's pretty phenomenal for, you know, a small place like Hobart to have such a major influence on global understanding of climate change and, and, and setting um, the agenda for, for how we respond to, to this you know, major challenge of our time. The scientific evidence is stronger than ever. Human influence on the climate system is clear. Recent anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest levels in history. Climate change has caused widespread and profound impacts on human and natural systems. We have to act quickly and decisively if we want to avoid increasingly destructive outcomes. But we do have the means to limit climate change and build a better future. This is a story about the role of the IPCC from people who've been involved with it for decades. But first, a quick history. So the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is really an amazing human endeavor. The world's gotten together and said, this is an important problem. We need to bring together the best scientists we can and figure out what we know and what we don't know and what that means for, um, for the decisions that we need to make about the future. I don't know of other fields that do this. And so the IPCC had this task. Is the climate changing? And more importantly, is that change dangerous? Dangerous for people and dangerous for the Earth? Over the last 36 years, the IPCC has prepared reports in a rolling cycle of seven years or so, each leading to stronger outcomes. The first ones appeared in 1990. The first assessment report led to the formation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, right? That's the only body on the planet that's there tasked to the deal with emissions into the atmosphere. The second assessment report in 1995 said there is a discernible human influence on the global climate. But the third assessment report uh, led to the adoption of the Kyoto Protocol and that was at the time the only protocol globally for the control of emissions. The fourth assessment report actually led to the IPCC winning the Nobel Peace Prize, not a prize for research, for peace. Uh, so recognised by the Nobel Committee that IPCC was helping to stabilise the planet. The fifth assessment cycle was a game changer. It found the level of hazard warranted the Paris Agreement to limit warming to no more than two degrees, preferably one and a half. Three of the chapters were led by people in Hobart, actually, uh, remarkably. People, three people in Hobart, the capital city with the most coordinating lead authors in the world. But we actually had more uh, people involved um, collectively from the rest of Australia. Uh, it's a remarkable history of having uh, impact in the science around uh, climate change. I think very significant. Um, both in terms of the science that we do here that feeds into the IPCC assessments, but then obviously too in terms of um, the number of people that have directly contributed as authors in various forms. The sixth assessment report was completed in 2023. It's really driving the discussion towards zero emissions uh, across the planet, and there's agreement actually by 
2050 to go to zero emissions, uh, to half by 2030 by almost every major nation. These are huge, huge uh, policy outcomes from the development of these reports over sustained, sustained over the last 30 years. I think the key part is that it's a, a fundamentally a team effort <laughs> and it's you know, so the, the lead authors and the coordinating lead authors and the contributing authors are all representative of take big teams of scientists that, you know, work together. During these last three decades, Antarctica has moved to centre stage. One of the things that has changed in the science is our understanding of just how important Antarctica is to the global system. A few decades ago, we thought that we might have to worry about Greenland melting, but Antarctica was probably pretty stable. And we thought that the West Antarctic part of Antarctica might be a problem, but the rest of it, where most of the ice was, was not a problem. And now we realize that East Antarctica may also be making a big contribution to sea level rise through melting, for example. But it doesn't stop there. So changes in Antarctica affect weather patterns at lower latitudes. They affect how much heat and carbon the ocean can store. They affect how much oxygen gets to the deep ocean, and therefore the whole chemistry and biology of the deep sea. So the influences of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean that surrounds it extend throughout the globe in a way that we've only recently come to understand. I got involved with IPCC because I, I wanted to put my hand on my heart and be able to say that I really understood how the process works and I wanted to do that because I spend a lot of my time engaging the public on climate change. And I get a lot of questions about the IPCC and how robust that is. And I have two children that are teenagers and I want to be able to look them in the eye and say that I did everything that I could at the time, that I knew how to. Uniquely, IPCC reports are only published with sign-off from all member governments. The summary for policymakers is worked through word by word, line by line, with representatives of all of the countries that are keen to come, which means most in the UN process. It's a uh, terrifically frustrating, kind of fascinating, but um, bizarre experience, really. So it was a, a different experience for me particularly because at the time I was working as a lead author, I was on maternity leave, so I was juggling a new baby and a two-year-old, <laughs> um, which was very challenging. In the end, decision-making is by consensus of all 195 member countries. Everybody has an opportunity to comment, including governments, but the scientists maintain their independence. In the end, they are the ones responsible for the text. But the text needs to be acceptable to the scientific community as a whole, not just any individual interests. So that's a very exhaustive process that takes four to five years. I think it'll be great to, for the speed of the process to match the, the change that's happening in our climate. Uh, we know how much change is happening very, very quickly and the IPCC's reports are fabulous, the ones that came out last year, but now we won't have a, another edition until you know, five or more years away and who knows what condition the world's climate will be in by then. Sometimes it seems like we could write 90% of the report at the first meeting, but to get everything right takes another three years. And so there's a frustration in that to me. You know, it, the IPCC is absolutely critical, but it's not the only thing we need to do because sometimes it's a slow pro process and sometimes we need to be able to get the word out quite quickly. A coordinating lead author, I think, is one of the most exciting roles you can actually have in uh, the IPCC process, because what are you there for? You're there in control of the development of a chapter in a subject that's incredibly, re incredibly relevant, right? Incredibly relevant to the planet, to the world, to everybody that lives on it. People often ask, would you do it again in terms of being an IPCC lead author? And I kind of view it a bit like childbirth. The first, um, the first time you do it, you might go, never again. Um, but after a little while, that kind of fades. And yeah, I think I would do it again, yeah. It's more than scientists who need the IPCC. The IPCC's really been the, the 
the way that the world has learnt about climate change. The IPCC is that sort of clarion call. The science that's being done in Antarctica will really tell us what's happening and how fast we need to act. Perhaps if we could have an IPCC meeting here in Hobart and really get that global spotlight on the findings that are coming out of this city uh, and coming out of the, the institutions doing work on Antarctic science, we might get more global attention from global decision makers about how fast they need to move to reduce emissions. I think that would be fantastic for Hobart to host a meeting of the IPCC. I would love that. I could go to one, finally. <laughs> Over the last 30 years of warnings from the IPCC, the faraway future of climate change has become what's happening right now. The day when you could really hide behind the uncertainty in the science to justify lack of action is over. It's just not credible in the way it might have been a few decades ago. There's two things that were crystal clear in this most recent report. The first one is that we really are experiencing the projected impacts of, of climate change. If anything, they are coming harder and faster and larger than we anticipated. And the second thing though, just as import and important and just as clear, is that every fraction of a degree of warming that we can avoid will absolutely uh, be pain and suffering averted and it's never too late for us to do more.